Thank you, everybody, for coming to the Aaron Torres Podcast YouTube page. I do have one quick favor before we get to the video that you came here for, and that is very simply this. You see that little red subscribe button below this video? Go ahead, smash that subscribe button. It really does help me. It really does help this channel grow and my audience grow. So go ahead and hit that red subscribe button. And now, here is the video that you came here for. All right, finally, there is one last piece of kind of stay or go news that I do want to get to, and I decided to save this one till the end for a couple reasons. One, uh, the player just frankly, at least on paper, is not as big of a name as some of those other guys that I mentioned, so it felt good to save him till the end. But on top of that, the player, uh, Jacob Toppin, who we're going to talk about in a minute, plays at Kentucky, and this was a day on Tuesday that was actually actually a pretty big news day at the University of Kentucky. It's always busy in the offseason at Kentucky. It's especially, uh, there's always seems to be newsworthy things this offseason specifically coming off the St. Peter's loss. There's been some frustrating recruiting things. Uh, and so it turned into a really busy day. Jacob Toppin's coming back. They have finalized the coaching staff. And oh, by the way, my buddy Matt Jones mentioned something very, very interesting about another thing that they could do with the coaching staff this offseason. So let's get into the day that was at Kentucky, and like I said, we'll kind of wrap the show with the Kentucky news. First of all, the player that is returning is, as I just said, Jacob Toppin. Obviously, you all know, you don't need me to tell you, the younger brother of Obi Toppin who plays for the New York Knicks, their dad was a very good player in his own right, and I think Jacob Toppin has really shown some flashes, and I really believe that despite only averaging 6.2 points per game last year, only starting four games, this is a move that matters more than you think, because I think he has the potential to really be a breakout player next year. And I believe that when you're looking at a guy that only only started four games, only averaged 6.2 points, context matters in this case as to why those stats were the way that they were, but also why he could break out next season. So what is the context around Jacob Toppin and why I believe he could be a, a, a big piece for a Kentucky team that I actually think might actually be a little bit better than we're giving them credit for, again, in a controversial offseason for John Calipari. So first of all, in terms of why I think he could be a breakout player, there's a few reasons. I mean, one, I just said it. He's got the NBA genes and the NBA bloodlines, okay? This is a guy whose brother plays in the NBA. This is a guy who regularly, when he's with his brother, is working out with NBA guys, around NBA guys. His dad, obviously, again, was a high-level player in his days. And so it's not as though we're talking about some backup that averaged six points per game that's five foot eleven with a slow first step. Like this guy's six foot ten, six foot nine, whatever he is, can jump out the gym um, and has all of these the measurables to have a high level of success in college basketball. I think it's also important to note that like when he did play last year, and he actually played his best in some of the biggest games for Kentucky. I went back and looked it up. 11 points versus Kansas, 14 versus LSU when LSU was really good undefeated early in the season, 13 versus Bama. I think it's important to note that opening night game against Duke, when he got put on Paulo Bancaro, Paulo Bancaro really struggled, and so you started to see flashes, but the reason that he didn't play last year was because he was behind Keon Brooks, a very similar player to who he is and what he does. I actually think you can argue that Jacob Toppin is maybe, certainly in the long term, has higher upside than Keon Brooks, and this is no disrespect to Keon Brooks, but I think that, 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 that he probably is a better player and will be a better player next year in college basketball, but last year Keon Brooks started in large part because this is just what John Calipari does, right? John Calipari, in general, gives the benefit of the doubt to the older players, especially the guys that are great leaders, the guys that have sacrificed for the program, and nobody did that more than Keon Brooks two seasons ago during the COVID year when Kentucky was a complete mess. And so Keon, I believe, kind of got the benefit of the doubt last year. Jacob Toppin showed flashes, but Jacob Toppin was never going to start over Keon Brooks. And so I believe that Jacob Toppin this year, Keon Brooks will not be back. He declared for the draft, but then entered the transfer portal. I believe that Jacob Toppin has a chance to be a breakout star. Again, NBA size and measurables played his best against the best teams, which means to me that when you're not playing VMI and you're not playing um, Eastern Kentucky or whoever, and they're not trying to slow down the game and they're not trying to ugly it up, when you're playing other teams with comparable talent, NBA level talent, like LSU, Alabama, Auburn, Kansas have, Jacob Toppin was awesome. And the, 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 the better the talent, the better he played, the more that he elevated his game. More playing time, played well in big games, 
And I actually think he fits better with all of the pieces at Kentucky next year. And so when I look at Kentucky, let, let, let me go from the, the Jacob Toppin element of it to how he fits in with this team specifically. What I would say is what I just said a minute ago and what I've said all spring long. I understand the frustration of Kentucky fans with the state of the program coming off the worst NCAA tournament loss in program history. I understand that we're coming off a 2021 season in which Kentucky, of course, was a disaster. And really, it's been about seven years since Kentucky has really looked like the Kentucky teams of the early John Calipari era. It's been seven years since you made a Final Four. And I understand the frustration of Kentucky fans right now that are just saying our program is going in the wrong direction. Worst season in modern history in 2021. Worst NCAA tournament loss in 2022. Weird recruiting stuff, which we discussed with Shaden Sharp. We discussed with DJ West. Wagner. We're going to talk a little more DJ Wagner here in a minute. Um, but I also believe that while I understand the frustration, I do think that we have to, I, I do think maybe the best way to put it is that I think we're kind of overselling how good Kentucky could potentially be next year. First of all, let's never forget, this was a team that in early February went to Kansas and beat the eventual national champions by 20 points. And there was a big chunk of the year where many people, myself included, sat there and said, I think this might be the best team in college basketball. I think they're good enough to win a national championship. You don't want to take my word for it? I had Sean Miller on this podcast in mid-February, and I think Kentucky was the first school that he mentioned in terms of teams that he liked that were capable of winning a national championship. Well, two starters are back from that, that team. Severe Wheeler, the point guard. Oscar Shibway, National Player of the Year. I believe you have an upgrade with Jacob Toppin at the four spot next to Oscar Shibway. He plays better alongside Oscar Shibway than Keon Brooks did. And then the other two spots are going to be filled by pretty similar players. Last year was Ty Ty Washington, five-star freshman in the backcourt. Next year it's going to be Kaysen Wallace, five-star freshman in the backcourt. Last year, alongside those four guys, Ty Ty Washington, Oscar Shibway, Keon Brooks, and, uh, and who's the last one that I'm missing, Severe Wheeler? There was a guy named Kellen Grady. Well, guess what? You got another great three-point shooter in C.J. Frederick, and if he's going to come off, the, if he's going to start, then he he will fill the role of Kellen Grady admirably. And if he doesn't start, you got a transfer named Antonio Reeves who could step in as well. And so when I look at this Kentucky team, I understand the frustration of last year, but I also look at it in the the thirty thousand foot view of. I think this team has a chance to be pretty similar to what it was last year, and for as frustrating as the loss was to end the twenty twenty two season. Let's never forget that, again, this was a team that most of us felt for most of the year was good enough to win a national championship. And so when I look at the 2022-2023 roster, and I'll be quick here because we want to move on to the, the assistant coach hiring and the, the juicy, spicy meatball of a, of, a, of a coaching rumor. But I look at next year's team, and if you're telling me that last year's team when healthy, when at 100%, was good enough to win a national championship, I'm sorry, but a team that has two starters back from that team, maybe the two most important ones, point guard Severe Wheeler, who has to get better, has to stay healthy, has to stay in shape, but also led, led the SEC in assists, and Oscar Sheepway, the National Player of the Year, I believe there's a, 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 an upgrade at the four spot, and I believe the other two spots are going to be comparable, if not uh, you know, basically the same as last year. And so all I'm going to say, and I'll wrap and we'll get to some of the coaching news and all that kind of stuff, I do think that, again, I understand the frustration from Kentucky fans, but I also think that we're probably underselling the upside of next year's team as well. Once all the news is official tomorrow, I will release my updated top 25, and unless something shocking happens, Kentucky is going to be in that top 10. I'm not ready to say right now that I think they're the favorite in the SEC ahead of Arkansas because Arkansas has a ton of talent. But I mean, Kentucky's going to be somewhere in that six, seven, eight range. And if you're six, seven, eight, that means you're going to be a, one, a two seed with the potential to be a one seed, and you're going to be good enough to win the national championship. So Jacob Toppin is back, and this is my bold prediction for next year. I believe he steps up. I believe that the confidence that he now has from going through the NBA draft process and the fact that nobody is in front of him, that Jacob Toppin is going to be an all-SEC first-team performer. You heard it here first. I am really high on this guy's upside, and I think with the increased playing time with fewer pieces around him that kind of do the same thing, I think Jacob Toppin turns into a star. All right, really quickly, two other news and notes pieces from uh, Kentucky on Tuesday. The first one is that they filled their assistant coaching spot. And if you listen to this show, we talked about it about a month ago, but in a very controversial move, 
Jay Lucas, super young, super dynamic recruiter, especially in the state of Texas, announces that he is leaving Kentucky for Duke. It wasn't just that he left. It was that he left for the same position at Duke. One, from Duke's perspective, it was kind of interesting because Coach K historically had only hired from within. He didn't bring in people from outside, the family outside, the brotherhood. But from the Kentucky perspective, it was especially interesting because you lose a bright, young, dynamic assistant head coach to a school that, while you don't play every year, is your rival. You're going in, uh, you know, you're recruiting the same caliber of players every year that Duke is, and now you lose a key assistant to Duke. It was crushing. It was frustrating. And since then, there has been a, a spot on the coaching staff that is open. Well, this week, we got confirmation on who it will be as Tuesday. John Calipari announced, drumroll please. <laughs> Kentucky's assistant coaching spot will be filled by KT Turner, who comes from Oklahoma. Now, let me say this. When I saw this news, I saw, obviously, the Kentucky fan base. This was a guy that probably was not on their radar, but they seemed to be pretty frustrated. But that was because, let's be honest, they didn't know what to expect. Is it going to be a guy with an NBA background? Is it going to be a guy that we know? Is it going to be a name that we don't know? Let's be honest. How many assistant coaches do you really know in college basketball outside of two or three of the really big ones, right? You know, um, you know, John Shire when he was an assistant because of the success he had. Jay Lucas because of the success he had. Maybe a guy that works on Chris Beard's staff at Texas or a new guy at Duke or whatever. There's not that many guys that you actually know. And what I can tell you is while I don't know KT Turner personally, I've heard nothing but good things. One, I actually have a listener of the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast. I won't mention your name, but you know who you are. At least one that has worked with KT Turner. I won't say where or when who said nothing but good things. And I should mention, by the way, KT Turner was, the, was an assistant coach this past year at Oklahoma on Porter Mosier's first staff at Oklahoma. Prior to that, he was at Texas with Shaka Smart. Prior to that, he was at SMU with a couple people, including Larry Brown. And Larry Brown apparently had big sway in this announcement. And so why I bring it up is because and Larry Brown, of course, was John Calipari's former boss at both Kansas and with the Philadelphia 76ers. Obviously, John Calipari really respects Larry Brown's voice in this decision. And so I only bring it up because I cannot sit here and say that I know KT Turner personally, but what I can tell you is everybody that I talk to loves him. The guy that I know that has worked with him, won't name his name, what school he worked with him at, but he said this guy's great, he's dynamic, he's great with kids, he's a great recruiter, he's super plugged in in that southwest portion of the country, the Texas, Oklahoma area, and he is everything that you want from an assistant coach. Great with the kids, everybody likes him, good recruiter, all that good stuff. I would also say I talked to Porter Mosier uh, at one point last summer, and he mentioned how excited he was to work with KT Turner and how impressed he had been early in their run together. This was maybe two months after he was hired, but I like it. I mean, listen, I like it. At the end of the day, I think there were some Kentucky fans that were a little bit surprised, but again, how many assistant coaches do you really know? And then on top of that, what is very clear to me is that what John Calipari is trying to do is replicate the success that he has had in recruiting Texas, specifically under Jay Lucas, by bringing in another guy that has deep ties in that state. You don't need me to tell you, but over the last couple years, the state of Texas, I think you can argue, produces as much high-level Division I talent as any region of the country. Maybe California is somewhere pretty close, close in terms of the sheer numbers. But the players that have come out of Texas the last three, four, five years are unbelievable. Um, Kate Cunningham, R.J. Hampton, Kaysen Wallace, Tyrese Maxey, I'm just going on through my head. Anthony Black, who's in McDonald's All-American, going to Arkansas next year. Kaysen Wallace, I just mentioned, is going to Kentucky. So the talent is there, and what I believe is that John Calipari was trying to replicate the success that they had under Jay Luke, with Jay Lucas on the staff by adding KT Turner. Can I sit here and say this is the, the, the hire that's going to change the program forever? No, I can't. But it's clear that John Calipari prioritized recruiting. What I will say is kind of interesting is I've heard from some different coaching staffs over the last couple months. With NIL the way that it is, recruiting is kind of less of an important thing because some schools are just willing to you know, do what Nick Saban accused Jimbo Fisher of is just pay what it takes to get a kid to campus. Kentucky does not appear to be willing to do that. John Calipari came out and said a few weeks ago he doesn't make guarantees in NIL. So recruiting is obviously still of a priority to him. And I think this was a good hire. 
We know that Orlando Antigua runs the Northeast. We know that Chin Coleman is successful in the Chicago area. KT Turner is going to hit a very important spot in the Texas, Oklahoma area. And like I said, the people that I spoke with seem to really like him. Finally, last little piece of recruiting news, and this is a doozy. And it goes back to something that we talked about over the last couple weeks, which is the recruitment of the number one high school player in America going into this coming season, DJ Wagner. His dad was an elite high school college player in his own right, played for John Calipari in Memphis. It was deemed that his son was going to play for John Calipari at Kentucky forever. Then last week, Louisville hired DJ Wagner's grandfather, Milt Wagner, um, who of course played at Louisville and is the grandfather of the number one high school player in America. And the thought was, including from me, including from every recruiting writer, that it makes DJ Wagner a lock to go to Louisville. So why do I bring it up? It is because my good buddy Matt Jones, Kentucky Sports Radio, put out a very interesting tweet on Tuesday following the KT Turner news. Tweeted a little bit about KT Turner, and then he mentioned this. And this is a direct quote from Matt Jones' Twitter feed, so I'm not paraphrasing. He said, I am also told that there is a world where Dewan Wagner, obviously the father of DJ Wagner, could end up joining Kentucky basketball in some capacity. Not finalized, but possible. You hire grandpa over at Louisville. We hire dad. And so let's get into this because this is a juicy, spicy meatball of a topic. And listen, what I would say is obviously it speaks to the fact that, um, you know, one, we might not be done with this, but two, It just speaks to the fact that D.J. Wagner has the most interesting recruitment in all of high school basketball. What I would say is a couple things. One, I'm just going to flat out say it. If John Calipari can make this move and he can do it in a manner in which he can still recruit and potentially sign the son, I think it's an absolute no-brainer. Just think about all these guys that have done something to this effect over the last couple years and how it's benefited their careers. Mike Boynton at Oklahoma State, a guy that I respect, a guy that I've had on this show multiple times. He signs Cade Cunningham by signing, also hiring his brother in an on-the-court role. Oklahoma State has a great regular season. Oklahoma State goes to the second round of the NCAA tournament. Other schools start snooping around. Mike Boynton gets a huge extension. Andy Enfield over here in Los Angeles hires Eric Mobley, a guy that I respect a ton and we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. His son Evan Mobley turns into a first-round pick. Top five pick, plays for Cleveland, leads them to a play-in game this year. The older brother, Isaiah Mobley, plays three years at USC, leaves for the draft after this season. During that time, USC had the third most wins over those three years that the Mobleys were on the, st- uh, were on the roster. The third most wins in all of college basketball behind only Kansas and Baylor. That is absolutely insane. It got Andy Enfield a nice extension, and to me, I think that we're at this place where John Calipari thinks, you know, hiring family members or doing this, doing anything other than what is normal is beneath me. It's not beneath you. It doesn't, it's not beneath you. If you hire the guy, if you hire the dad, if you hire Milt, or you hire Dewan Wagner, excuse me, major difference, and the son comes with him, and the son goes to the Final Four, who cares if it's beneath you? But I do believe that John Calipari has kind of convinced himself that it's beneath Kentucky and it's beneath him to do this kind of stuff, and I think he's out of his mind. I think if there's a way you can add Dewan Wagner and he can, you can still recruit DJ, I would add you better sign DJ if you hire Dewan Wagner. If you don't sign, if you don't sign Dewan Wa- DJ Wagner after you hire his dad, that's an insanely bad look. But if there's a way you can do it, you can do it. Because here's the other thing. On top of the fact that it's just going to help your team, it's going to help your program, it's not as though DeWan Wagner wasn't a great basketball player, right? So I just mentioned Eric Mobley, the father of Evan Mobley and Isaiah Mobley. I know Eric very well. But I remember talking to Andy Enfield when the hire was made, and Andy said to me point blank, he goes, Aaron, look at the guy's resume. The guy, first of all, his two sons are superstars, so you know he can develop talent. But this guy played major college basketball. He played at Portland, WCC, and he had like a 10-year career overseas. Guy was a professional for 10 years. You think he can't come in and help my program? And it's the same with Dewan Wagner. If Dewan Wagner was a plumber or an accountant or a lawyer and you're hiring him to get his son, yeah, that's a little bit different than hiring Dewan Wagner, former number one high school player in America, former lottery pick, former NBA player. 
And obviously, if you hire him in some off-the-court role, he can't be on the court, but it doesn't mean that he can't mentor these guys. It doesn't mean that he can't help. It doesn't mean that he can't um, you know, be a sounding board, being whatever. And who cares if you get the sun? So I have no idea if anything will come of it. Obviously, as I said, it would have to be in a role in which uh, Dewan Wagner, you could still recruit the son because you don't hire Dewan Wagner if you can't get the son. And what I would finally say is this. You hire Dewan Wagner. You better be darn sure that DJ is coming with him because if you still lose him to Louisville or if you lose him to Memphis, wh- who, wherever you lose him to, whew, I do not think that is something that you can recover from if you're John Calipari. And poor Dewan Wagner, probably get, you know, whatever. It'd be a, t- it'd be a tough couple of months for Dewan Wagner at Kentucky uh, if his son is playing college basketball elsewhere. All right, I think that's it for this episode of the Air Tour Sports Podcast. You know, I'll say this. 